Hello, everyone, and welcome. Thanks for joining us tonight. I'm Dan Brooks, founder of 3GNY and a grandchild of four Holocaust survivors. For those who don't know, 3GNY is an educational nonprofit for grandchildren of survivors and supporters. As a living link, we preserve the legacies and the lessons of the Holocaust. Our mission is to educate diverse communities about the perils of intolerance and to provide a supportive forum for the descendants of survivors. For tonight's event, 3GNY is joined by eight other 3G chapters across the nation from New Jersey, Philadelphia, Boston, Miami, Arizona, Baltimore, and San Francisco. We all felt strongly that tonight's event, the current state of anti-Semitism, is a topic that needs to be discussed. With today's social media, the spread of disinformation and outright defamation of the Jewish people presents a major challenge to our community. It's incumbent on us all to educate ourselves about these changes and learn best approaches to combat the world's oldest hatred. I'd like now to introduce Josh Lepowski, a senior research analyst with the Counter Extremism Project and a fellow 3G. Josh will be our guide tonight on this topic as he unpacks the new anti-Semitism and, and the modern incarnations of the world's oldest hatred. He holds degrees in global affairs, journalism, Jewish studies, and Hebrew. He has previously worked as an award-winning journalist for multiple Jewish media outlets, covering anti-Semitism and the Arab-Israeli conflict. Josh, thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here tonight, although the topic is not uh, a great one. Um, but uh, just to start off uh, giving you a little bit of my background, I am the uh, grandson of two Holocaust survivors. Uh, my maternal grandfather and grandmother uh, uh, respectively survived uh, Bergen-Belsen and Auschwitz. My mother was born in the Bergen-Belsen DP camp uh, following the war. And they uh, were then resettled uh, in New Jersey. Uh, just one a quick anecdote I would like to share uh, about my grandparents' story. Uh, when I was in eighth grade, I was assigned to do a hero project, and I learned a story about my grandfather in the, uh, while he was in Bergen-Belsen uh, that my family only learned at his funeral. Uh, he worked in the kitchens uh, at Bergen-Belsen, and to his uh, putting himself in danger and as well as others, uh, he would sneak out scraps of food from the kitchens and bring it uh, back to the barracks. And uh, he did this because knowing the danger, but because he felt it was the right thing to do. And uh, we learned of this story, not from my grandfather, but from uh, one of the survivors uh, who was saved because of this. So on that note, uh, I will share my screen and we will get started. This month marks the third anniversary of John Ernest's horrific attack on the Chabad House in Poway, California. On the last day of, uh, of Passover, killing one and wounding three others, Ernest claimed inspiration from Brenton Tarrant, who had killed 51 people. Uh, pardon me, one second. Just try, there we go. Uh, who killed 51 people and wounded three others? Uh, uh, Ernest claimed inspiration from Brenton Tarrant, who had killed 51 people during twin mosque shootings in New Zealand the month before. Tarrant subscribed to a white nationalist philosophy called the Great Replacement, which postulates that non-European migrants threatened to replace the dominant white European culture. In Tarrant's manifesto, also entitled The Great Replacement, he wrote about the, quote, crisis of mass immigration 
and how it would, quote, ultimately result in the complete racial and cultural replacement of the European people. Tarrant, Ernest, and other white nationalist groups have attempted to define a broader white uh, European ethnic identity prevalent in the Western world that transcends national borders. They believe that identity is threatened by non-European invaders who want to uproot the dominant culture and implant their own. While Tarrant focused his hatred on Muslims, others like John Ernest and Robert Bowers in Pittsburgh have included Jews as part of the, the perceived foreign threat. Since the 2018 attack on Pittsburgh's Tree of Life synagogue, observers have noted an increasing number of anti-Semitic attacks and the emergence of what many are calling a new wave of anti-Semitism. Incidents like Poe and Pittsburgh are blatantly anti-Semitic and easy to condemn, but anti-Semitism anti is not always so recognizable. In New York City, the NYPD recorded a 50% increase in anti-Semitic incidents in 2021 over the same period in 2020. These attacks included assaults on individuals and vandalism of Jewish institutions. Last May, as Israel and Hamas fought an 11-day war, Jews thousands of miles away from the Middle East found themselves under attack because of their religious affiliation. Between May 9th and May 24th last year, Britain's Jewish community recorded 116 anti-Semitic incidents compared to only 11 during the same period in 2020. In the United States, the Anti-Defamation League received almost 200 reports of anti-Semitic attacks after the conflict began. The group also noted more than 17,000 Twitter posts with variations of Hitler was right. On May 18th in Los Angeles, a group of men waving Palestinian flags attacked Jewish diners at a sushi restaurant. And according to witnesses, the attack attackers chanted death to Jews and free Palestine. A 2020 American Jewish Committee survey found a majority of American Jews felt anti-Semitism was a problem, while 82% felt there had been an increase in anti-Semitism in the United States over the past five years. So the question now is, what is driving the surge of modern anti-Semitism? First, let's settle on a definition of anti-Semitism. In 2016, the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance adopted a working definition of anti-Semitism, which has since been adopted or endorsed by more than 30 nations and organizations, including the United States. According to that definition, anti-Semitism is a certain perception of Jews, which may be expressed as hatred toward Jews. Rhetorical and physical manifestations of anti-Semitism are directed toward Jewish or non-Jewish individuals and or their property, toward Jewish community institutions and religious facilities. The IHRA listed 11 examples of how anti-Semitism manifests, including calling for, aiding, or justifying the killing or harming of Jews, accusing Jews as a people of responsibility for the real or imagined crimes of an individual, accusing Jews of being more loyal to Israel than the nation in which they live, and denying the Jewish people the right to self-determination. So how is this all manifesting? The next step to understanding modern anti-Semitism is to look at its history. While the argument can be made, anti-Semitism can be traced as far back as the Egyptian captivity, for our purposes, let's limit our focus to just the past 2000 years. And so many major events of the past two millennia, particularly in Europe and the Middle East have been driven by religion. Christianity and Islam acknowledge their historical roots in Judaism, and base their own validity on the idea that Jews have either rejected God or have been rejected by God, allowing room for the creation of new covenants uh, presented by those religions. Early Christianity pointed to the Jewish rejection of Jesus as the basis for a new covenant with God that superseded the Jewish covenant in the Torah. As Christianity became the dominant religion of Europe and the church became the dominant political power, this rejectionist lens led to the proliferation of laws limiting Jews socially, professionally, and politically. The average early European peasant's knowledge of Jews and Jewish practices stemmed largely from church doctrines that emphasized that, uh, the Jewish rejection of the Christian Messiah, thus justifying the Christian rejection of Jews. Further, because of the communal nature of Jewish religious practice, Jews tended to live within close proximity of each other, which led to the development of Jewish quarters in medieval towns. 
Some of these Jewish quarters later became ghettos after official de uh, decrees ordered that Jews should be physically separated. Jews remained behind walls for 400 years in Europe, further contributing to suspicions as to why it was necessary to separate them from society, as well as what took place behind the walls of the ghetto. This separation created a natural aversion among Christians to Jews living in their midst, and therefore few made the effort to look beyond what they had been taught, they instead theorized based on their limited knowledge and suspicions. The misunderstood nature of Jewish practices also helped feed into myths surrounding them. Observers would see Jews hanging a mezuzah on their doors and recall something from the Bible about Jews in Egypt painting their door frames with blood. The natural conclusion was that Jews were again using blood for some sort of ritual purpose, which fed into accusations of the blood libel, that Jews were taking Christian children for use in sacrifices and other religious rituals. Like Christianity, Islam has promoted the notion of Jewish rejection. According to the Quran, God rejected the Jews based on their rejection of biblical laws, but Jews were people of the book and God had given them opportunities to repent if they desired. While Jews living under Muslim rule tended to enjoy more freedoms than in Christian Europe, Jews were still largely relegated to second-class status at best. These religious roots of anti-Semitism informed centuries of restrictions and conspiracies, culminating in mass events like the Spanish Inquisition and the Holocaust, while feeding everyday bigotry that led to the rise of the blood libel, government decreed tribunals against the Talmud, and mob violence. By the dawn of the 21st century, Jewish political fortunes had wholly shifted. Jews enjoyed unprecedented political and economic freedoms and had reestablished their biblical homeland in Israel. This ascension began slowly with Napoleon's emancipation of French Jews in the early 18th century, but it wouldn't be until uh, the horrors of the Holocaust that Jews would attain true emancipation. The large Jewish uh, migrations to America of the 19th and 20th centuries came at the same time that other nationalities and ethnic groups were migrating to the United States. Like other minorities, Jews were subjected to widespread discrimination, but eventually discrimination gave way to success, and that success spread jealousy and contempt among those left behind. So let's take a look at who hates us now. Populated by neo-Nazis and white supremacists, the far right is a familiar antagonist and remains a primary source of anti-Semitic violence. Groups such as the National Socialist Movement and League of the South promote blatantly anti-Semitic propaganda and imagery, while others such as Robert Bowers couch their bigotry in language that reframes their enemies as threats to society and themselves as heroes fighting to preserve their culture. As previously mentioned, a common theme among the far right is the great replacement theory, the notion that non-European immigrants seek to replace the dominant white European culture with their own. Proponents of this theory proclaim this replacement threatens a genocide against the white race. One such group that subscribes to this is the Patriot Front, a relatively new white, white nationalist group with a nationwide presence. The Patriot Front is an outgrowth of Vanguard America, one of the groups behind the 2017 Unite the Right rally in Charlottesville. It embraces imagery that is both patriotic and fascist while employing nationalist messages such as America first and better dead than red to paint itself as the savior of an America that is losing its culture to foreign invaders. The front is uh, dedicated to creating a nation within a nation that it claims will be a quote, hard reset of the current America which it believes is subjugated by an international Zionist agenda and money. While the Patriot Front is an admittedly nonviolent group that stages banner drops, rallies, and protests to distribute their propaganda, these kinds of actions only go so far. The replacement theory has also attracted those who feel they need to take more physical action to end what they consider the genocide of the white race, such as Robert Bowers. After the Holocaust, the Hebrew Immigrant Aid Society, Hayas, helped many of our families resettle in the United States, including my three-year-old mother and her parents, who were brought out of Bergen-Belsen and resettled in New Jersey. Today, Hayas continues its mission helping refugees around the world. Viewing the organization through the lens of the Great Replacement Theory, however, Bauer is accused of bringing foreign invaders into the United States. 
He viewed his horrific actions against the Jewish community as part of a crusade against those supporting this supposed invasion. Even as the far right has traded the hoods and brown shirts of the 20th century for polo shirts and khakis, the rhetoric of the far right is overt and its anti-Semitic anti undertones are easily identifiable. The far left, on the other hand, has embraced a more discreet form of anti-Semitism by blurring the line between anti-Zionism and anti-Semitism. Traditionally, the Jewish community has been drawn to left-wing ideology and causes because of the idea of tikkun olam, the concept of repairing the world. Nonetheless, the left has mainstreamed strands of anti-Semitism through its embrace of social justice causes. Israel and its supporters have become a favored target among the far left, which holds that Zionists and Israel, the Jewish nation state, symbolize colonialism and oppression. On college campuses, Jewish students find themselves targeted by those seeking to punish all Jews for the actions of the Jewish state. In April 2019, for example, members of the Emory University chapter of Students for Justice in Palestine posted fake eviction notices on the doors of Jewish students in Emory's residence halls and off-campus housing in protest against Israeli demolitions of Palestinian homes. The sole qualification for receiving a notice was to be identifiably Jewish. Campus leftists have vociferously rejected any relationship between anti-Semitism and anti-Zionism. Indeed, a popular uh, mantra on the left is that it rejects Zionism and the state of Israel, not Jews as a whole. But the reality is that otherwise left-leaning Jews are forced to separate their Jewish identities from their liberal values and choose between the false dichotomy of being liberal or being uh, Zionist. For example, this past October, a proposed voting rights rally was enveloped in controversy after one of the participating organizations issued statements condemning the participation of pro-Israel Jewish organizations. The Freedom to Vote rally was organized by the Declaration for American Democracy Coalition. Sunrise DC, a branch of youth-led climate organization Sunrise Movement, issued a statement declining a speaking spot at the rally because of the participation of the National Council of Jewish Women the Reform Movement's Religious Action Center, and the Jewish Council for Public Affairs. Sunrise DC called for their ejection from the rally as they are, quote, are all in alignment with and in support of Zionism and the state of Israel, and quote, Zionism is incompatible with statehood and political sovereignty. Following a national outcry, Sunrise DC issued an apology and said it understood why its initial statement had been seen as anti-Semitic. However, the group also emphasized its continuing commitment to, quote, stand against Zionism, anti-Semitism, anti-Palestinian racism, and all other forms of oppression. Other left-wing groups have sought to explicitly prevent the display of the Star of David and other Jewish symbols that are shared by the state of Israel, thereby excluding displays of Jewish pride by linking all such symbols as representative of the state. These groups collectively hold, uh, hold all Jews responsible for the actions of the Israeli government. There is an assumption of responsibility for Israel's actions by virtue only of a shared religion. Thus, why, while the far right lumps together all Jews in its vitriol, leftist groups like Sunrise DC have created a with us or against us formula that essentially category, categorizes Jews as good Jews or bad Jews based on their support of Israel solely because of a shared heritage. So how does this all come together? What we are seeing from both the far left and the far right is an attempt to normalize anti-Semitism. On the far right, anti-Semitism has been reframed as a jingoist defense against foreign invasion. On the far left, anti-Semitism has been reframed as a litmus test for devotion to social justice. We still see the expression of pure Jew hatred in physical and verbal attacks, as well as vandalism and other acts of intimidation. But there is also this attempt on the left and the right to make anti-Semitism more palatable by portraying it not as an, an irrational hatred of Jews, which it is, but as the protection of nationalist or socialist values, or, or social values, I'm sorry, not socialist. Um, at the core though, 
today's anti-Semitism is very much the same anti-Semitism we have witnessed for thousands of years, but repackaged to fit modern narratives. Historical anti-Semitism has been both a response to the presence of Jews and a manifestation of the fear of Jews. At the core, what we see is a fear of perceived Jewish power and strength. The Jew is the enemy that needs to be defended against. The Jew is controlling and influencing the system. The Jew is responsible for the ills of the world. Despite a lack of power, Jews have historically been blamed for events that would require a great deal of power. Historical Christian anti-Semitism is rooted in the belief Jews were responsible for the death of Jesus, assigning Jews not only the power to sway the Roman government, but to also commit deicide. In medieval Europe, Jews were accused of poisoning water wells to cause the plague. And again today, we've seen the far right lash out at Jews for either creating, spreading, or holding back a cure for the coronavirus. Hitler and the Nazis blamed the Jews for Germany's economic and social woes, creating a convenient scapegoat to distract the German people and a target for their anger. Hitler didn't innovate the perception of the devious Jewish power brokers, but he successfully incorporated it into a national narrative. And despite decades of research into the Holocaust, including photographic and anecdotal evidence, that narrative survives. A 2020 survey by the, a survey by the Conference on Jewish Material Claims Against Germany found 11% of Americans under 40 believe the Jews were responsible for the Holocaust. 15% said they thought the Holocaust was a myth or had been exaggerated. And in New York State, 20% 20 20 of adults under the age of 40 felt that Jews had caused the Holocaust. The implication of all these accusations is Jews have the power to shape national and global events. Even the charge of dual loyalties, which long predates the establishment of the modern state of Israel, assumes the presence of a larger, powerful Jewish entity that commands ultimate fealty, such as the shadowy uh, learned elders of Zion. The irony is Jews have historically been powerless throughout much of modern history. They've been restricted professionally, forced to wear identifying clothing, forced to live in specific areas, and generally made subservient to the whims of the ruling class. As Jews began to gain a modicum of freedom, the historic, historical scapegoat became an even larger target. In fact, some of the biggest anti-Semitic myths were born out of the historical repression of Jews. The Jewish association with finance stems from the medieval professional restrictions on Jews that limited them to money lending because the Catholic Church believed uh, collecting interest was sinful. The myth that Jews control Hollywood and the entertainment industry arose in, in the early 20th century when Jews joined the burgeoning American film industry because they were often shut out of other careers. Such accusations are no longer exclusive to far-right conspiracy theory, uh, theorists who see Jews as shadowy, uh, shadowy puppeteers, or radical Islamists justifying terrorism, or leftists who vis, uh, vilify Israel as a Nazi state. Historically, it was easy to assign blame to a powerless and nomadic group, charging Jews with responsibility for society's ills, alleviated, re alleviated responsibility from those with actual power. And more importantly, it distracted the general population from holding those in power responsible. The emergence of a physical Jewish nation state in 1948 provided anti-Semites with a centralized representation of Jewish power on the world stage, replacing the Illuminati-esque elders of Zion with a very public manifestation of Jewish power. As Jews, uh, Jews gained political and economic success in the 20th century, old anti-Semitic attitudes mixed with modern politics to cast suspicions on successful Jews who must obviously be in service of a larger cause, whether Israel or another vast Jewish conspiracy. And these attitudes continue today. For example, some of you may have seen memes circulating the internet, labeling the heads of global medical and pharmaceutical organizations as part of a vast Jewish conspiracy. Such attitudes are not confined to the dark corners of the internet either, as shown by a 2018 CNN poll that found one third of Europeans think Jews are too politically powerful. Further, these conspiracies of Jewish power have seeped into the political mainstream on both sides of the aisle. When US Representative Ilhan Omar accused APAC of unduly influencing US foreign policy, she was accusing Jews of having too much power. 
when then presidential candidate Donald Trump told a group of Jewish Republicans they wouldn't like him because they couldn't control him with their money. It was based on a belief, though benign, of Jewish power. In an increasingly polarized world, it has become common to hear those on the right and the left accuse one another of, of presenting the greater danger while downplaying rhetoric and actions from their own side. But both sides of the political spectrum have employed anti-Semitic imagery and rhetoric based on the per uh, pervasiveness of old stereotypes and a continuing belief that for whatever reason, Jews hold the keys to the, hall, the halls of power. This underlying theme is at the core of all forms of anti-Semitism, whether it is overt or unintentional. And just as an aside, not all anti-Semitism is intentional. Sometimes it may truly be a stray comment about Jewish bargain hunting uh, or a misplaced remark about Jewish business acumen based on ignorance. Nonetheless, whether the intent is malicious or not, the origin is in an age old belief in Jewish power. The result of this type of rhetoric is people like P uh, Pittsburgh shooter Robert Bowers and others like him taking it upon themselves to strike back against these perceived enemies to reclaim that power or hate crimes against Jews under the guise of social justice as at Emory University or suicide bombings and car rammings against Israelis. We've also seen these kinds of ideas manifest outside the Jewish community in recent years. In 2017, white nationalists marched through, uh, through the streets of Charlottesville, uh, Virginia, chanting, you will not replace us. In March 2019, Brent Tarrant uh, attacked two mosques in New Zealand. And much like Jews were blamed for poisoning the wells of medieval Europe to cause the Black Plague, followers of QAnon conspiracies pinned the blame for the coronavirus pandemic on Bill Gates, 5G cell towers, and even vaccines. Various QAnon theories blamed Gates for creating the virus, seeking to profit from a coronavirus cure, or potentially using a vaccine to implant controlling microtechnology into people. While QAnon theories may not specifically target Jews, they mirror the pernicious tropes of secretive manipulative cabals seeking global domination that anti-Semites have used against Jews for millennia. Combating anti-Semitism means recognizing it in all of its forms and vociferously condemning it. It is incumbent upon all of us to educate ourselves to recognize anti-Semitism in its many disguises and speak out forcefully. For as Hillel said, if I am not for myself, who will be for me? Because for those who feel insecure in their current place in the modern world, and especially for those who wish to manipulate unease in order to gain power for themselves, the Jew continues to be a convenient tar uh, target. As mentioned earlier, uh, I am the grandson of survivors, and I just want to dedicate this memory this presentation to the memory of my mother, Trudy, who passed away last year. Uh, she was a fierce believer in the power of education. I also am dedicating this to the memories of my grandparents and all victims of baseless hatred. Now, 2000 years is a lot of content to squeeze into 25 minutes. So for a more in-depth look at the history of anti-Semitism and the themes I discussed tonight, Please see the Counter Extremism Project's anti Semitism resources on our website, and I'll drop all this information to the, into the chat as well. And with that, I'll turn it back over to Daniel. Thank you so much, Josh, for that um, very thorough breakdown, for considering it was only 25 minutes. It's a lot of good information. Uh, I will be joined now by um, 3GNY President uh, David Wax and going through the questions in the Q&A. Um, and I do have uh, the first question that, um, that does speak to what you just talked about, about your family. And I, I'd like if, you, if it's possible to talk a little bit about um, your connection um, with your, um, your grandparents. And the question is, has your uh, you're being a 3G influenced your career, and if so, how exactly? I, I would certainly say so. Um, growing up, I uh, heard many stories of my uh, grandparents' experiences in the Holocaust, uh, and it was always, 
a, a big part of my childhood, as well as my parents' focus on education. Uh, and that certainly led me to uh, my first career in journalism, uh, and uh, specifically in Jewish journalism, as I sought to uh, be a purveyor of truth and knowledge. Um, Within, uh, while working within Jewish journalism, I discovered an, an affinity for international stories, which led me eventually to uh, obtaining a master's degree in global affairs and which led me to my current position. All right, thank you. I'm gonna now uh, alternate with David Wax <laughs> and ask the next question and we'll, we'll take turns uh, looking at the Q and A box. So again, um, as Dave just texted in the, um, uh, the chat box, if you have questions, please put them in the Q&A and we'll get to them as, as uh, we see them. Yes, please ask away anything. Um, we'd love to try and you know, answer any questions you have. Uh, before we dig in onto some deeper ones, I will ask a, a lighter one. Um, what, what is the definition you know, of the difference between left wing, well, left wing and right wing anti-Semitism? So left-wing left anti-Semitism and right-wing uh, both approach from different uh, lenses. The left-wing uh, anti-Semitism tends to approach uh, view uh, through a lens uh, focused through social justice and Israel uh, uh, in specific. Uh, so the focus is not so much on Jews, but on who is, uh, but on fighting perceived oppression. And Israel is held up as an example of modern oppressors uh, in many far left circles. The right wing and the far right tend to focus, uh, are, approach anti-Semitism through a lens that is focused primarily on Jews. So the far right either acts through a specific hatred of Jews or they act through uh, the, the lens of uh, defending their own culture uh, against replacement from foreign uh, influence as mentioned earlier with the great replacement theory. Thank you, Josh. Uh, next question is, um, I'm sure it's something on all of our minds because we're hearing a lot of reports about this on a daily basis. How, does, um, how can we support Jewish college students on campus suffering from anti-Semitism in their lives there? Mm -hmm. uh, that is a very good question. Uh, I would say that the best way to support them and also to combat anti-Semitism in general is through education. And so to support Jewish college students, support Jewish organizations on campus that provide resources to those students as well as education to uh, non-Jewish students on campus. Making and any activities that make Jews and Judaism accessible and visible and help bring it uh, down to those who are not as familiar will help to dispel uh, other uh, myths and uh, misperceptions about Judaism. Can I do a quick follow-up? Are there details or specifics on those Jewish organizations at the Counter Extremism Project, or do you have uh, references? Uh, Hillel, Eshat Torah, Chabad, uh, many universities have Jewish studies programs. Uh, so I would say uh, reach out to those organizations and departments, uh, as well as uh, history and uh, language programs on campuses, uh, they can also provide uh, help in uh, organizing educational uh, activities. Thank you. Um, here's one uh, from the audience. 
That's good. Since you're researching hard and traumatic events, what, if anything, brings you hope in your role? Mm. <laughs> so <laughs> I don't trade in hope. Um, no, uh, no I, I do have hope uh, because I see a lot of people taking stands. I see a very nice turnout here tonight. I see people who are interested in learning and expanding their own perceptions. And uh, not just within the Jewish community, uh, but so it's that willingness to engage that gives me hope and that uh, I, I uh, do have uh, one slightly off topic, uh, uh, slightly related uh, side note from that uh, recently, uh, read a piece in the Atlantic about a, a an Islamist preacher in Australia, uh, Musa Sarantonio, who uh, last year, uh, who was previously considered one of the top propagandists for ISIS, uh, but uh, went to prison a few years ago. And last year he uh, renounced ISIS completely after uh, taking the time to read through the Quran and reached the conclusions they're not right. Uh, the ISIS is not right. Um, so that uh, it, there is an openness among some people, and that is what gives me hope, that willingness to learn. Okay, next question is, um, how does social media affect anti-Semitism today? And I'll, I'll actually add my own addition to that because it's, it's something that I think about a lot about social media. Um, do you think that social media outlets are doing enough to combat it? So off the bat, no. Uh, so social media is, provides anti-Semites and other uh, extremists a platform to spread, uh, spread their views, not only uh, with uh, sympathizers, but to those who uh, do not um, uh, automatically share their views. So they have a platform to recruit others into their uh, ideologies. The Counter Extremism Project, uh, since its founding uh, in 2014, has been adamantly fighting to get social media companies to take more responsibility for the content on their sites. Many of these groups, uh, these platforms, Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, all have terms of service agreements that deny, that uh, refuse to allow uh, extremist content on their platforms. And the Counter Extremism Project is call has been calling on these uh, platforms to enforce the terms of those agreements. Um, how and you know maybe when does anti-Israel sentiment cross into the anti-Semitism zone? Sure. So anti-Israel is not necessarily always anti-Semitic. Uh, just two weeks ago, I saw a uh, an, a pro-Palestinian anti-Israel rally marching through the streets of New York City with, of course, a large contingent from Nedere Karta, uh, the Hasidic sect. Um, so, but the anti-Semitism, uh, anti-Zionism rather, crosses the line into anti-Semitism when it singles out Israel above all other nations and denies Israel the right to exist. If it holds Israel to a higher standard, than any other nation and ignores any other uh, uh, any other nation's crimes. That is when it starts to cross the line. Okay. Our next question is: um, What advice would you give on how to combat anti-Semitism on the left? Um, it can be tough having these conversations since anti-Semitism on the left is not always as blatant. Mm -hmm. So regarding combating anti-Semitism on the left, it is a matter of being vocal and being present uh, with 
organizations that are barring Jewish symbols uh, because they are too closely associated with Israel uh, or barring Jewish groups from rallies and demonstrations, it is important to speak out and make a very public stand that this sort of action is not acceptable. And that will, you can start the conversation privately with them, with these groups, but, uh, or individuals, but that uh, eventually uh, will have to turn into a public di discussion. And that will help bring more pressure and open up the conversation uh, to hopefully change some policies. Um, <clears throat> what, this is a two-part question, so you can answer it however you want, but is, what, are, what are the most common manifestations of anti-Semitism and what area is the fastest growing? Oh, wow. <laughs> So it, 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 it's, I'm not sure I can answer which is the fastest growing, but I can say that uh, the anti-Semitism on the far right tends to be more organized uh, and more visible because of that. You see actual organizations such as National Socialist Movement uh, or League of the South uh, or Patriot Front uh, that are specifically anti-Semitic. They, in their rhetoric, uh, they either employ Nazi sim uh, symbols uh, and Nazi uh, uh, rhetoric, uh, or they are specifically speaking out against Jews and making anti-Semitic claims. Uh, and by the uh, by their very nature they are uh much more organized and tend to have better platforms websites social media presence uh demonstrations uh that are specifically anti-semitic and so they are more visible and the violent the the specifically planned violence does tend to come more from the far right the far left is not uh, uh, does not have as many specific anti-Semitic organizations as the far right does. It is more uh, is not uh, as overt uh, as previously mentioned. Uh, you will see it uh, couched in other ideas uh, and you have to dig a little deeper, but uh, you can find it in other uh, rallying cries uh, that do tend to surround uh, the issue of Israel. Josh, uh, in your presentation, you uh, discussed briefly uh, the IRA definition of anti-Semitism. Um, how would you propose that the Jewish community can support this um, this understanding of anti-Semitism um, and how is that really the best, uh, is, is that an effective way to rally the community uh, mm -hmm. together on this issue? So there has actually been a competing definition that was uh, released uh, in recent years. I think it was uh, last year or the year before. Uh, I don't recall offhand, um, but uh, uh, a group of academics uh, decided that the IRA definition was too focused on Israel and uh, limited uh, criticism of Israel. So they you know, created a separate definition. Uh, but the IRA definition has been adopted by uh, dozens of countries around the world, including United States, several in Europe, Israel. Um, as well as multiple organizations. And I think that remains the best definition available. Uh, and so I would say it is uh, Jewish uh, education groups uh, and activists should look to that definition and promote it 
uh, as part of their own educational efforts. Can you elaborate on, on one of the points you just made? How does the IRA definition address criticism of Israel and, and anti-Zionism? Mm -hmm. So the, uh, let me just grab my notes on that one uh, so I can have the exact definition in front of me uh, and not misspeak on that. Uh, I believe there is one line in there referencing, and correct me if I'm wrong, um, describing Israel as a quote unquote racist endeavor, which I suppose, would you agree is um, one form of anti-Zionism? Uh, I, I would uh, say uh, that yes, uh, call, referring to Israel as a racist endeavor is a form of anti-Zionism and uh, as well as anti-Semitism. Um, so the IRA definition does uh, call out the delegitimization of Israel. And so that is uh, a good line to draw in the sand. Are you, are, when looking at rhetoric, are you uh, singling out Israel above others? Are you calling for the state to be dismantled? Uh, are you calling, or are you calling for reform within uh, the state's practices? If you want the state to change its behavior, that's one thing. If you believe, uh, if you say that Israel does not have a right to exist, then you are saying the Jewish people do not have that right to self-determination that all other people have, then that is where it crosses into anti-Semitism. So here's one from the audience. How does how how is it how does the BDS how is the sorry how is the BDS movement anti-Semitic? So the BDS movement, the boycott, divestment, and sanctions movement, uh, was started uh, by uh, several Palestinian activists, and it does call for the total economic, political, social, uh, educational boycott of Israel. And it often uh, ignores, uh, it, it, it often does this uh, while ignoring all other crimes. So we, uh, the BDS movement uh, does fall into the category of anti-Semitism by its very delegitim uh, very nature of the delegitimization of Israel to such a point that the Palestinian Authority does not embrace the BDS movement officially. Uh, it has uh, called for boycotts of the settlements uh, in the West Bank, but not for, uh, has not gone as far as the BDS movement uh, in uh, calling for the complete cultural boycott of Israel. Thank you, Josh. Uh, next question. Um, and this is a heavy issue. Can you discuss the trend of attacks on religious Jews, primarily in New York City, and the relationship between African Americans and Jews in this context? Mm. So in recent years, there has been a noted uptick in attacks on visibly Jewish individuals uh, within New York. Uh, every week I see more reports um, coming from the police of uh, various attacks, people being harassed on the streets, uh, physical attacks, uh, people uh, uh, gang having their uh, yarmulkes, hats, uh, knocked off, things of that nature. Um, so these uh, attacks are, over the past couple of years, there has been more of an openness uh, among extremists uh, uh, on the far right to voice their ideas, uh, as well as, and this has extended to anti-Semites as well, uh, so we see a lot more than we used to. On the, on the other hand, it could also be partly due to better reporting, which 
uh, is a positive, but we still need to seriously address uh, these uh, weekly, if not daily, uh, occurrences. Uh, regarding the relationship of the uh, uh, African American community and the Jewish community, uh, it has been a long and uh, bumpy uh, relationship. Uh, in the 60s, Jews were at the forefront of the civil rights movement. And uh, since then, there have been uh, uh, many more uh, disturbances uh, between the Black and Jewish communities. So uh, some uh, popular uh, Black authors uh, have written about the uh, relationship being of one of uh, tenant and landlord, uh, and that uh, Jews represented the the landlord, and uh, uh, while the black community represented uh, the uh, mistreated tenants uh, in their buildings, um, and so that that relationship. Uh, it, this this analogy uh, emerged in the uh, 70s, I believe it was, and uh, we also see uh, groups like the Black Israelites uh, that uh, who were responsible for the attack in uh, whose some of whose members were uh, responsible for the attack in Jersey City, uh, and like uh, some other groups, they. Re, uh, they believe subscribe to a theory of replacement uh, that they have. They are the true uh, children of Israel, and that the current uh, Jews are uh, pretenders, uh, so that they justify harassment and uh, violent attacks by staking their claim to the legit uh, what they consider the legitimate legacy of the people of Israel. What, and uh, I see, I see. Okay. There's uh, a comment about Farrakhan also. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, Farrakhan and his Nation of Islam uh, have dealt with that uh, reject a Jewish uh, theme of Jewish rejectionism. That uh, uh, very specifically, uh, Farrakhan has promoted the idea that uh, God wholeheartedly rejected the Jews, and that. Uh, uh, because of that, it is essentially open season. And I'm just going to take one second to drop some information in the chat. I forgot to do this earlier. Uh, just wanted to put out, uh, this is my contact information and links to our reports uh, for anyone who would like to follow up uh, on those reports or follow up with me afterward. So there's a big question that's probably been asked by three people, <laughs> and and, uh, and 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 there are others probably too who are thinking this, you know, uh, and that is how do we counter anti-Semitism? How do we combat it? Like, what can we do today as a community, uh, whether it's on campus, whether it's in daily life? Any suggestions? <laughs> the main things that we can do to combat this are education and speaking out. We must take a, a vocal stand. Um, during my, uh, when I was in high school, uh, living in State College, Pennsylvania, um, my mother was on the oversight board of Penn State Hillel. And at the time, uh, someone, a known anti-Semite in the area had taken out a, a, a Holocaust revisionist ad in the student newspaper on campus. My mother and other uh, Hillel board members and student members uh, joined together on campus to uh, protest this. And it was events like this that helped form my own uh, dedication to uh, 
recognizing and pursuing absolute truth and making uh, those statements and fighting back against uh, uh, ignorance and uh, misinformation. It is educate so education and the willingness to stand up are the best tools that we have. It is best not to uh, resort to physical altercations uh, uh, unless uh, uh, in self absolute self-defense, but uh, make your arguments logically through uh, well thought out points and just present those arguments and you will find that uh, the anti-Semites just cannot uh, stand up to that. So I have uh, one more question and then I think um, we're gonna have to call it. <laughs> but uh, uh, in terms of education, uh, do you in your current position, uh, you know, go to schools and present about this type of topic or have you also ever used like your grandparents' story and gone into classrooms to use that in terms of education? So my mother uh, through the 90s and early 2000s uh, would uh, go to schools to speak about her, uh, her parents' experiences and her own uh, growing up as a child of survivors who uh, learned to walk in, uh, in front of the barracks at Bergen-Belsen. Uh, and uh, so I actually have uh, hundreds of letter, thank you letters uh, sent to her from uh, middle school students uh, across uh, Pennsylvania uh, for her years of speaking. Um, in my position, I have spoken with uh, synagogues, rotary clubs, uh, and other uh, organization, uh, organizations, as well as some student groups. Uh, so I look to the example set by my mother uh, to continue uh, that and really be a beacon of information as best as possible. Josh, um, we thank you so much for taking us through your presentation and for sharing, uh, especially about your grandparents. Um, that, that's very meaningful to us. And I'm sure uh, that we've all learned something tonight. Thank Thanks again, all of you. Oh, sorry. Uh, thank you very much for having me. Uh, I did want to just quickly address uh, one thing in, I just saw in the chat uh, about uh, Islamist anti-Semitism. Uh, so I didn't uh, cover that so much in the presentation. However, if you re uh, click on the links to uh, the reports, uh, it is thoroughly covered in those sections as well as in multiple reports on uh, uh, the counter extremism projects website. Great, before, before we sign off, I just had a few closing remarks, um, but thank you again. And thank you to all of us, all, all of you for joining us tonight. Um, this event and the contents therein really shows us all too well why education is more important and more urgent than ever. We uh, see the horrifying rise of anti-Semitism through headlines on a daily basis. And we know that we need to put the effort in to make a difference. Now, um, we speak often about the importance of educating youth. And um, as, I, as I mentioned in the chat, I'm currently an educator with an organization called Club Z, Zionism for Teens. Someone had asked about it. Uh, just a quick remark. It's an organization that educates Jewish teens about their heritage and the history of Israel and how to navigate these conversations that teens are having today about Israel, Zionism, and anti-Semitism, and most importantly, promotes pride in our identity and teaches Jewish teens to stand up for themselves. Now, in regards to Holocaust education, studies have shown that students who receive Holocaust education are more tolerant and more comfortable with people of different races and backgrounds. They're more willing to challenge incorrect and biased information and are more likely to be upstanders. So I'd like to share with you all how 3GNY is trying to make a difference to educate the next generation and to help prevent anti-Semitism and bigotry. 3GNY, we are proud to say, has trained more than 350 speakers in New York, New Jersey, Philadelphia, and around the country 
through its flagship We Do program, which stands for We Educate. We have spoken in more than 500 classrooms and we have impacted more than 31,000 students and community members. Again, 31,000 students and community members. Between our live programming and our YouTube channel, more than 18,000 additional people have heard our stories. Through our, through our grandparents' testimonies, we talk about the importance of stepping in early and often, where small injustices are found anywhere, on the playground, in the classroom, and on the street, because it's the easiest and most efficient way to act. By the time Nazi tanks rolls in, roll in, it's too late. So if you want to learn more, don't hesitate to reach out. There's an email address in the chat, and you will all receive a follow-up email tomorrow. And I do have one more announcement. We're very excited um, to uh, advertise for our first in-person event in over two years, which will be a happy hour gathering on Wednesday, May 25 at Hidden Lane Bar in Manhattan. We're looking forward to seeing each other in person and many of us who have met virtually over the past two years haven't yet met in real life. So this is gonna be a great event. We hope to see many of you there as we convene our wonderful community of over 16 years. There are also gonna be many other virtual uh, events upcoming, including discussion groups and more, of course. We'll send out an email tomorrow with info on these events, as well as a recording of tonight's program. Thank you again for taking the time out of your evening to be with us. We are grateful as always for your presence and your support. Good night.